Uh, I sincerely appreciate all of you attending. I appreciate the speakers that have come from uh, out of town, Jim, and the ones that are relatively local. Why this seminar? Um, tonight, for those of you that aren't Rotarians, Tom Faulkner is being installed as district governor, <coughs> excuse me, of the Upstate Rotary Clubs. Tom has spent his career in community redevelopment with the Nehemiah Corp Corporation, and he wanted Jim Fields from the Palmetto Institute to come up as his keynote speaker. Uh, you can see Jim's bio, and, and uh, you'll hear him shortly. But because Jim was coming up, we thought we'd grab a couple of other examples of, of upstate redevelopment and just talk about them, see if there's common themes, see uh, what the role of business might be, what the role of Rotary might be, what the role of government is. So I think all three of them are different case histories. I think they're excellent case histories. Um, and I think, uh, I think there will be a lot of, of, of good that comes from this seminar. Um, I have handed out the bios of each of the speakers, so I won't bother to go through a, a formal introduction. Um, we will have uh, Rick Danner, the mayor of Greer, talking about Greer redevelopment in general. We'll have Jim Fields talking about um, what he's been doing in Lake City, which is nothing sh short of remarkable. Ron McKinney is going to discuss the west side of Greenville and Ed Mehmet talking about the north side of Spartanburg. So with that, gentlemen, uh, Rick Danner, I'd like for you to kick it off, if you would. Uh, our format will be the speakers will have 15 minutes each, and then we'll have 30 minutes or whatever's left until 4.30 to uh, just kick around the themes and let you ask, ask questions of the speakers. So thank you. Well, great, and uh, thank you, and I appreciate it. I am uh, Rick Danner, the mayor of Greer, and it's my honor to, uh, to host you today. Um, as, you, as you came in, you passed some restroom facilities in an area out there. If you need to make a phone call or step away, uh, just there in the hallway is a, is a good place to do that. Um, we're proud of this city hall. We've been in it about four, going on five years now, and uh, be glad to show you around, as you can see. The entire second floor of this building is public space that opens out onto a park uh, and is part of a much bigger design in terms of what we have tried to do with this building that we will uh, may possibly talk about just a little bit later. From the Great Wall to Greer, now I, that, that's, that's a, bit of, a bit of a stretch as we talk about downtown Greer, but uh, as you can see that is uh, my wife and I standing in front of a section of the Great Wall there, and so I thought that, uh, if you'll bear with me, we'll spend the next 15 minutes looking at slides of our vacation to China. So if that suits y'all, we, uh, we will do that. Actually, we were in China and uh, had the opportunity to visit with some friends the area right outside of Beijing called Balding, which is one of the finest examples of, of the wall. Uh, as you can see, it, it crosses, and this is not an actual picture, but crosses uh, the mountains in various different uh, directions there as an example of this project that uh, was in the making some uh, 13 to 14 centuries, and uh, at one point in time was a continuous wall 5,500 miles long. Uh, if you started in Charleston, it would stretch to L.A. When you got to L.A., you could turn around and come back, and that's the approximate length of that wall. So it, it gives you some idea of the scope of that project, and that's a little bit of what I wanted to talk about today is perspective, because perspective is important in terms of talking about development and redevelopment of our towns and cities. The story is that many of the people that were conscripted to help build this wall uh, would work on a certain section of the wall. And that might take a lifetime, it might even take generations of the same family sometimes working on one section of wall. And if they weren't at this area, maybe in Balding, where they could see tens, maybe a hundred miles of the wall, they had no idea what they were working on in terms of the scope of that project. Uh, it wasn't, in fact, until we began to do some space travel that, we real, that they realized the enormity of this project. 
it can be seen from outer space. One of the few uh, man-made uh, projects on the on the on the Earth that can be seen from outer space, and so you don't get a true scope of what this is about until you see it in a much broader perspective. And that's what I want to talk to to you a little bit about today. This is downtown Greer in the late 1990s. We had survived the, uh, the exodus of the uh, textile business in the uh, 70s, 60s, 70s, and the early part of the 80s, but we were at a point in time where our downtown languished, if you would allow me to use that word just a bit, uh, and there were a number of efforts underway by various different groups to revitalize, to re-energize our downtown. The city was working on efforts, the chamber was working on efforts, economic development was working on efforts, the CPW, our Commission of Public Works, were working on efforts. And as you can see, there wasn't a whole lot of traction. And it was this point in time that we began to have some discussion about how do we bring all of those various different elements under one sort of umbrella to see if we could move forward. And out of that, in the late 1990s, came an effort called the Partnership for Tomorrow. The Partnership for Tomorrow, as you can see, was comprised with these elements in mind in terms of what we wanted to do based on the various efforts of the different groups. It was going to be incentive focused on community revitalization and economic development, focused on community development, economic development, a city center revitalization and education. And the partners in that would be the City of Greer, the Greer Commission of Public Works, the Greater Greer Chamber of Commerce, local area schools, and the private business sector, an important part of this. We've done three efforts so far. We're in the midst of doing our fourth right now, phase one, which was conducted in, um, from 99 to 2003, was $2 million. Phase two raised 1.53, and phase three raised 1.6. The effort that we are undergoing right now has a targeted amount of 1.2 for its budget uh, for the next um, f four to five years. Now what, what this plan is, is a rolling 15 year master plan. It was done as a 15 year master plan, which is not to be confused with our comprehensive plan or our strategic plan, two separate efforts that are ongoing as well too, but with a little bit different focus but a 15-year plan that we could implement. Now, it has rolled, as you see, because every four years as we re-implement uh, a funding stage for this, we also extend that period out. So this new period that we're working on right now in terms of a fundraising effort from 14 to 18 will give us a projection of what we're looking at in 2030. So it is a forward look about what we want to do. This is, the fi this is the area that we looked at in terms of some pictures just a minute ago. It is the five points area of downtown there. And one of the first items that was identified through the master plan was to begin to do some work in this five points area and address some pedestrian and traffic needs that we had um, in that area and identified were encumbrances to revitalizing the area. And as you can see, uh, conceptually and from some of these plans, we have implemented the vast majority of what we talked about doing in that area. It included some traffic control, marked side, sidewalks and crossings, widening of the sidewalks to make them more pedestrian friendly, certainly the landscaping that was added and other amenities. In addition to that, um, we began to work with some of our private property owners. And you can see the first year, we were able to grant nine facade grants for a total of $25,000. And then the second time, we were able to grant nine facade grants for a total of $59,000. In addition to the grants that we made to allow some of our buildings to do, to do some facade work and to do some updates, there were at least two uh, re, uh, renovation projects rehabilitation projects as well too. Now keep in mind as you look at the projects that were done um, that, that are newer uh, upfits, how they blend with the existing buildings in there. One of the things that we were very cognizant and conscious about doing 
was keeping the scale of downtown, keeping the historical feel of downtown, keeping the walkability and the look the same. We didn't want a mixture of different types of architecture uh, in that downtown area because the, the downtown area is under a historical overlay district based on the fact there's over 40 buildings that are protected by a historical registered designation in the downtown area. So we wanted to make sure that we kept that feel. We were fortunate, we only had two open areas, two gap tooths in the entire downtown area. Those two were a place where a building had collapsed due to neglect and one that was destroyed by fire. And what the city did to help those folks was that we went in and did pocket parks in those areas that have allowed them to utilize them for outdoor dining and for outdoor service of their restaurants, but yet they are a city maintained park area. Um, it's, been a, it's been a good addition to the, uh, to the area downtown and was certainly beneficial to those folks that had buildings located next to or on either side of the gaps. We wanted to make sure that our, uh, our uh, money was where our mouth was or our mouth was where our money was, whichever one it is, and uh, we wanted to demonstrate to folks that if we were going to talk about downtown revitalization, that we wanted to have a part of that. And we wanted to demonstrate that to, uh, to the citizens of our community. This was in the plan from the very beginning. Now, I will, uh, I will admit that this isn't the exact piece that was, uh, that was envisioned in the first uh, plan, but you have to remember these plans are always a living document and subject to change. And quite honestly, I am glad that we went with the design that we have rather than the original suggestion, which was built more around the idea of a, t of a town square. We were able to accumulate over 12 acres at this site uh, and only used eminent domain on a couple of pieces of property uh, in this entire area. The rest was purchased and, and brought together under the city's control to allow us to begin construction. The courthouse that's now on the corner of Main and Trey or Poinsett, uh, one of the, the, the primary corners of the building, was built on a site that was a parking lot and a police station, which has now been incorporated into the new courts building there on the corner. This was an investment on the part of the city of a little over $21 million that we have supplemented by adding another facility on the other side of the pond near here. Uh, which was a renovation of an existing structure, an old armory for about another $1.2 million. So we've, we've demonstrated to the tune of uh, uh, nearly $25 million that we are indeed here to stay. That has resulted in what we now call and refer to as Greer Station. This is a 15 block area in downtown Greer that has uh, undergone a complete transformation in the last 15 years, a area now that boasts a number of restaurants, retail and office space in the downtown area uh, that, um, is, is a, that represents over 400,000 square feet of space available. Uh, that translates into dollars. If you want to talk about return on investment, uh, we've calculated that based on public investment, our return has been somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 17 to 1. And you can see it reflected somewhat in our retail numbers, other than the slight dip there that followed uh, the downturn in the real estate market in this area. You've got a trending upward line there of retail sales in the, uh, in the area. Now, how did we accomplish that and what is the message today? Well, in terms of what you're going to do, you need to capture a vision. You need to be able to sell that vision to the people of your community. And regardless of how large or how small it is, you have to portray a vision that captures people's interest. I don't know if you can, well, I know you can tell, but look at that. That's a split screen picture. Uh, one side is uh, obviously from the 1950s. The other side was taken about a year ago. Uh, you have to be able to sell this vision if you're going to move forward in terms of uh, a plan or to make a difference in your community. From there, you need to create a workable and a sustainable public-private partnership. 
as we, as we talked about earlier on, we had four or five groups that were all working on different elements of the downtown area and how we were going to revitalize it. The difference that we've been able to make is to pull all those groups, including the private side, under one umbrella and focus those energies and attentions on a very specific area, the downtown. That has now broadened and our effort includes the Wade Hampton Corridor, the Buncombe Corridor, the 85 Corridor and others. But we had a very specific sort of interest in the downtown because that represented the heart of our community and we knew that we had to tell people that that was where we were going to start if we were going to make a difference in our community. We had them develop a strategic plan and um, like I said that's, that plan was, was uh, designed to last us 17 years and we are moving forward with that plan. Uh, working the plan as we plan our work and every time that we do another uh, funding cycle we update that plan to keep it as I mentioned livable, breathable, changeable and ongoing and uh, something to take us into the future. One of the most important pieces of having a plan though is to do something with it and um, we got stuck early in this process uh, with analysis paralysis. It's very easy to fall into when you have a 15-year plan because one of the first things that happens is that as a committee you want to do something and you want to do something significant but for a small community like ours and, 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 and for a committee like ours it became overwhelming to decide where we were going to start. What were we going to do that was going to demonstrate that we were ready to move forward and we spent quite honestly, about the first 12 to 18 months, trying to figure out what it, was going to be, what it was going to take for us to get this plant up and off the ground. And some of our investors came forward and said, what's going to happen, guys? We don't, we don't see bricks and mortar. We don't see dirt moving. And so we finally backed up and said, okay, we can't do a $20 million project. It took us about eight years to get that put together, but let's start where we can. And so curb bump outs, sidewalk work, uh, paving downtown, new street lights, new traffic signals, the kinds of things that you can do $25,000, $50,000, dollars at a time is where we started. And it was amazing the difference that it made when we began to do some of these little things. It really got the ball rolling, drove us hard into our second funding cycle, which was very successful and allowed the city to move forward to capture their vision of this facility and others downtown as things begin to grow. There are some links to the various different organizations that were involved and are currently involved, including a link to PlanGreer.com, which is our current uh, planning effort that is underway as a, a part of the new funding cycle, and uh, there is a link there to take a survey about what has, uh, what has occurred in downtown Greer and what is going to occur in the future and how you can be a part of that. Uh, as I said, uh, it's all a matter of perspective. The city of Greer is 28,000 people. In China, the smallest town we visited was 3 million people. The largest was over 14 million people. You know, 28,000 people is hardly a, a, a housing building in those kinds of numbers, but if you'll take it a bit at a time and, uh, and get started on something, uh, you can truly make a difference in your community. And with that, I'd like to wrap it up and we'll turn it over to uh, whoever's going to be next. Thank you. Rick, let me ask you one question while I'm getting Jim set up here. Are you, uh, would you say, um, <clears throat> what was your major driver? Was it the government of Greer? Um, well, some, somebody always has to take the lead. Um, I, I, I've mentioned several times that there were a number of different, uh, a number of different things going on. Um, you know, certainly from the CPW side, their primary interest was in selling services, selling electricity and water and sewer and those sorts of things. So new opportunities for them to be able to do that was of interest to them. To the city, it was revenue and a tax base, increasing our tax base, saving that downtown area. To the merchants, uh, of which at one point in time there were few downtown, it was about attracting others to help 
uh, engage uh, the community in building that downtown area up. It was those various different efforts that, that led a group of people, um, literally from all of those, to come together and to, and, and to drive this idea of bringing everybody under one umbrella. It's, it's absolutely critical that you have everybody on board because it's amazing the number of times that I've given this or similar presentations about the partnership, about our partnership, that I get to communities and say, how in the world were you able to accomplish that? We can't get our folks to even talk about coming together to have a meeting, or we tried this and the bottom fell out, or any number of different things. So the partnership is what was critical, and uh, I, I don't know that any one group gets to take responsibility for it. Good, thank you. Jim Fields, welcome to the Upstate. Thank you, George. It's a delight to be with you today. You know, I've, I've just noticed that uh, a former solicitor and a dear friend's in the audience. And so I guess I'm gonna have to tell you the truth now. <laughs> the, uh, uh, Darla and I have a propensity, Darla Moore, who I work with, have a propensity to steal. And the real idea for me coming today was not to speak to you, is but to listen to these guys <laughs> and get some lessons that we desperately need. We're the young people on the street. We've been at this in Lake City going on our, this is our fourth year, three and a half years. And, and, and I'm, as I listen to Rick, as, in, and as I know what Greenville and Spartanburg has done, because uh, <clears throat> Bill Barnett has already carried me down to Spartanburg, and of course I visit Greenville. Uh, I, I, I am just impressed beyond words, and I will be coming to you a lot more with questions. But, but let me just give you a moment's background on uh, the person I work with and why we're doing what we're doing in Lake City. I think that would be helpful to you. Oh, God, about 13 years ago in my uh, other life as the head of a government affairs division, McNeil Law Firm, I get a call from Hootie Johnson. I had done a great deal of work for Hootie, and he says, do you know Darla Moore? And I said, I've never heard of the woman. And he said, well, you're dumb. You should have. She just gave $25 million to USC. And I said, well, I should have. That's true. But anyway, the Senate had asked her to speak. And she needed some research, and Hootie said, would I help her get some research on South Carolina, basically the economic position of the state, the educational level of the state. So we produced the, uh, we produced the work, and she and I were sitting across on a, on a bench one day at, at her little grandparents' home, which is now her real home. And she looked across at me, and she read the stuff. She's an incredibly bright woman. And she said, and I won't put it in her words exactly because we have a nice audience, but she said, have I just flushed $25 million down the toilet? And I said, I don't understand the question. She said, I'm looking at an education system that will not give me the number of world-class students I want to go to the Dorland Moore School of Business. And when they graduate, I'm looking at an economy that will not keep them here in South Carolina. And as a result of that, she, she began uh, talking to like-minded people across the state, wonderful people, and created the Palmetto Institute and asked me to be the executive director. And in our early days, and I'll make this quick, in our early days, we worked from a platform of quality, independent, thoughtful research in which we would look at policies in the state that needed addressing and present our findings and hopefully our support to the policymakers. What we learned that has really driven us in our last four years is that in most cases, politics trumps research. And it's not even easy, I mean, it's not even hard. So we made a decision in, the last, in about four years ago to turn directly away from the 30,000 foot effort and go look for willing partners at local levels to do partnerships where we would have our, not only our investment in it, but our feet on the ground participating as a partner. And we decided one of our biggest efforts would be taking on Lake City, which is her hometown. It is a distressed, dying, small community with, with a 
high poverty school system, 90% free lunch, failing school system, in which the backer had died, the marketing of farming had died, the retail had died, and said, let's see if we can turn that around. Let us give an effort to see, can we re revitalize, re-energize that small community? And then as we do it, let's treat it as a research project and make sure that we journalize every day. We take notes, we get back and we say, right, wrong, and different. And so what I'm gonna spend my time today with you, and, and, and other than listening, is tell you some things that we have learned already and what we've done. I wanna tell you the things we have learned already because I think it, 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 it listening today, I, I wanna see if they match up. So I wanna get them out in the open and let y'all forget them quickly so if everybody says something different, nobody will remember. The thing, the thing, again, that, that, that we believe very strongly, that, that if you want to make real progress, start locally. Build from the bottom up and not the top down. There's a story by Jeffrey Canada, the guy who runs the Harlem, uh, Harlem Zone Charter School, I think. He came down and spoke a few years ago and he told a story of in the aftermath of, uh, of, of that horrible Hurricane Katrina, there was these desperate people on roofs of buildings waving their shirts and towels for help from the government. And as he said, they didn't come. They didn't come. And as you build your communities, you certainly hope that the appropriations that, that you pay in through taxes will come back fairly you hope that they will not pass legislation to harm you. You hope that there's, there's some instances where you can go to them for specific help for economic development and, and they'll help you like they would help a, a major uh, out-of-state company. But you don't wait for it. And that was our beginning and it's, it has re remained our process that we do. We do our things based upon local partnerships. And we think that is a better way. If it works in Lake City, it's gonna work other places. If it works in Greer and Greenville and Spartanburg, then we can take lessons learned and do locally things that we could never get done waiting for a gridlocked legislative process to work. That's one of the things that I, I wanna in, in, uh, emphasize today. The second one, there's a lot of times, and we were at fault too, we'd go, ready, shoot, aim, rather than ready, aim, and shoot. So we learned that good research, now not, not lengthy research, good research was critical. We found that Lake City had a downtown area that was architecturally beautiful to people because it's in the 1920s, and because they had been so poor they could not tear it down, so we had a chance to come in and redo it with a historical district preservation district with uh, working with the city to do a facade plan where we got uh, easements on the facades of all the downtown properties to the city for five years and then the city contracted with us to do the architectural planning and a certain amount of dollars in construction to go back in to redoing facades one by one and we moved rapidly on one block we got a lot to go because quite naturally in old property it takes a great deal more dollars than one could think but, but, but that, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was important. This thing, and, and I'm saying the same things, by the way, Rick is saying, but I just, I wanna say them so, so that I, I know that they're, they're, they're coming out right. We realized that we had to develop a private-public relationship, that that was a critical element. We could not do it without the community behind us, involved with us, and going with us every way. Uh, we realized also that we really needed to steal ideas. We really did. We did not have what we found in Lake City at 6,700 in a rural community, in a dying rural community, it was that the competency in several areas had left, the, the services, the infrastructure, water and sewer, th those kind of things, the, 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 the means to plan and have events, the competency had left. We, we were very fortunate, and one of the ideas, what I'd pass on to Greenville and Spartanburg, the thing to do to help otherwise, we signed an intergovernmental relationship deal with Columbia. And every once in a while when we ask them, they'll send their expert in water and sewer down for a day. Or they'll send their expert in grants in a specific area, housing. And they're incredibly helpful. 
because we don't have to re reintroduce the wheel, redevelop the wheel. They help us with the wheel. It's very, very important to us. So with, with those ideas and with our vision, we, bet, we went about the task of building hope. We thought that was the most critical thing we could do for a dying community, build hope and do something that would be amazing. And our first step was the center of city was a dilapidated parking lot what looked like a spaghetti village of, of utility lines above. And we took the utility lines down and we, we built a village green, which is a place, a beautiful green area that will hold four or 5,000 people with a permanent stage. On one side of it was a bean market, an old bean market built in the 1930s that at one time was the largest bean market auction place in the world. And it had dilapidated, we rebuilt it into a beautiful building by the way, to emphasize again our point about don't wait, we went to the state and said, this is will be our economic engine. Would you help us a little bit with some money? And they made fun of us. The then, then governor, who at that time he hadn't gone on the Appalachian Trail yet, but was on his way <laughs> shortly, uh, made fun of us about the string bean market. You know, Well, we built it. It is now the center of our activities. This year, except for four more Saturdays the entire year is rented out for activities, bringing business to our community. So there it was. We turned our attention next to another old building, the old Jones Carter Feed and Seed. <clears throat> and again, we were, the, we were with a little engine that did cutting. We built a gallery, an art gallery, because we had an idea, and I'll get to that one second. We had an idea, and we built this art gallery, and we wanted, we wanted to bring something from Smithsonian down. If you don't think that was a fun effort, first of all, the application's 40 pages. Second of all, they'd call, well, what about your fire suppression? And we said, well, we got these step ladders at both doors and we'll put people at the end with hoses. And they said, no, 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 no. So we'd do that. And then they'd say, whoa, what, what, what about your humidity? And they says, it's real hot in South Carolina. I said, no, 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 we'd do that. We, we worked and worked and worked and we finally got accreditation for at the highest level. And last year we brought, we brought in William Henry Johnson, the famous African-American artist that grew up in Florence, became part of the Harlem Renaissance, marvelous art. And he brought, the Smithsonian brought his $23 million exhibit to Lake City. And it's amazing. We've been to Philadelphia and Atlanta and Lake City. <laughs> so, so we're pleased with that. And in fact, this fall, we're bringing in Goya. First time Goya has been in the southeast, to my knowledge, the Spanish, wonderful Spanish artist to be exhibited in the fall. So, so we started looking at ideas to get the city involved. And the idea we came up with was art fields. We needed something to wake the, or introduce the, the Lake City to the world. We didn't want to be somebody's best kept secret anymore. We wanted people to know we were there. Darla put up $100,000 as a prize. We, we uh, limited it to the southeast, and we took in uh, art two-dimensional, three-dimensional. First year, we had over 800 entries. We had to reduce that to 400 and then begin to make the judgment. We, last, we went 10 days. We had lots of activities. We drew about 22,000 people the first time. And we were scared of 22,000 people coming into Lake City because we're not there yet. We're not like the things you've done in Korea. But here's the amazing thing. The amazing thing, and the thing that has made us most proud, is when we put out a call to the community that we needed volunteers, we had 300 come help us. 300. We knew that we had buy-in from the community and we could move forward. And move forward we have. We, we are tackling education. We are launching radical new programs in, in, in the school system in Lake City because you, you can say you want to, but if you can't go and build infrastructure and you don't have a workforce quality to sustain it, you're wasting a whole lot of money. We, 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 I mean, radical programs. We created Parents Academy. We created a new tech network system where you're taught on the clouds from laptops and problem solving. You don't, you don't learn what one and one is. You learn to solve a problem, and to solve it, you have to learn what one and one is. 
It's been incredibly successful in other schools across the nation. And we've been, uh, fortunately, all, all over the country looking at systems. We brought in an after-school program for, for elementary kids, mandatory three hours a day after school. Two things other than academic uh, uh, programs, social programs, the soft skills of life. You can't imagine in a stressed area how much that is missing, how much they want to learn those things. And we brought in fine motor skills. And you're going, what? <laughs> fine motor skills. We're teaching them how to knit or to do things with puzzles because a, a dysfunctional family will send you a kid that cannot concentrate, period, can't do it. And that fine motor skills gives them that ability again to concentrate. We've had remarkable results. We're launching reading partners. Uh, we, we're, we're launching everything we know how to help the school and improve its quality. And one of the things we're doing in downtown, in my, la my last point, is that we are underpinning uh, the renovation of buildings to bring in retail business. But in doing so, we are making them sign an agreement that part of their labor force has to be disadvantaged workers. They have to be. And we go help them with training, we go help them uh, with, with, with working with them, but they have to be. And this fall, and you should come down, is we're opening our first hotel on Main Street in Lake City. And it's going to be a blast because we've learned that there are dollars in tourism, there are people every day that want to come back to their roots, and that, and that, and that uh, there are activities that people really, really want to get away from the hustle and bustle of the world they face today and come. So it is that projects we're doing, we've just begun, we have nowhere where we need to be, but it's a fun project. We keep using the lessons we learned and hopefully we can package some things to go some other towns once we get at a level. But it's been fun and, and thank you all for listening to me as I continue to listen to the real experts. Talking about the west side of Greenville, and Ron, if I think you're up. Sure. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you especially to uh, Mayor Danner for hosting us. Um, this um, community and this city government have uh, a special place in my own heart, and uh, I've watched with interest over the last several years if, as you have uh, provided leadership for the kind of improvements that you have. I'd like to share with the group as well that I have personally witnessed uh, Mayor Danner uh, rise to principal over uh, expediency and regional efforts, and uh, he will always have my admiration um, for that. And um, I'd like to tell you uh, today, spend my time, uh, and I'm not an expert, I just happened to be there when some of it was going on. Um, and I want to tell you a Cinderella story. I want to tell you about uh, the role, and I want to tell, emphasize while there was a partnership, I'm here today to emphasize uh, as much as I can the, the role of uh, business. Uh, the West End in the 1980s uh, was connected to downtown Greenville, but just barely. And in the 1980s, uh, downtown Greenville was having its own issues but the West End was having special issues. Uh, substandard buildings, some of which were boarded up, many others of which were empty. And the type of businesses that were there were not the type that often, uh, that Rotarians would frequent. <laughs> I'm thinking, for instance, of my dealings with Johnny's and Vroman's, two, uh, two nightclubs down on Pendleton Street. Uh, in the city's part of dealing with some of the issues. One thing was to craft our zoning ordinances, but we also crafted our business license ordinance so that uh, it was no longer a case of repeated instances on the premises that would result in a uh, revocation of a business license ordinance. But if we could establish that all the police calls and the points of trouble were surrounding your business, 
uh, and establish that it was centered on your business, that would also be a basis for suspension and revocation. Uh, Drive-by shootings, prostitutions, drug deals, and the like, part of the life of that area. For instance, I remember one of these uh, fine establishments, uh, uh, a carload of people was going by uh, one of the nightclubs. They decided it was shooting time and uh, the man on the rear seat behind the driver placed his uh, weapon, handgun, outside the car window, pointed across the street. Unfortunately for him and uh, his colleague, he failed to notice that his colleague to the right of him was sticking his head out the other side of the car. And um, we were able to prove that uh, those who uh, engage in criminal activities are not always the smartest and the brightest. But these were certainly problems that we had. Uh, this shows you a, not a place that we wanted it to be. This, however, is an indicative representation of what these have been transformed into. Trees, uh, light posts, etc., uh, provided by the city, but all of these businesses were engaged in uh, redevelopment. What happened? Was it a master plan right away? No, not in the beginning. What it was was disgruntled, complaining, whining people <laughs> who began talking with one another. And in the process, they decided that some things needed to be done. There were West End residents. There were West End landlords, property owners and there were West End tenants, uh, businesses. And they began to come together and cry out. They petitioned the city government, they talked to one another, they came up with their ide own ideas, and bit by bit, it was achieving momentum. So we talk about the grassroots, then it's important to realize that people, even in their disgruntlement, even when they are not united in their vision of what should come to be, can work with one another. And they worked with one another and they brought attention to their problems to the uh, city of Greenville. The city uh, contracted with uh, consultants, uh, developed an overall plan for the area. Again, a loose plan, a guide, a hope for what it could be made investments in infrastructure through uh, tax increment financing and otherwise. And the general idea of the lo uh, people in the location as well as the city was to transform some old buildings into uh, what we call the West End Market, consisting of actually two or three buildings transformed into what was originally thought would be a farmer's market at the lower level and some retail space at the upper level. The problem is the farmer's market really didn't work out. Uh, the farmers weren't interested in it and people weren't willing to come there to buy it. Uh, ever the pragmatic group of uh, folks around here, here's another before and after um, scene. Um, they began to experiment with the things that did work. If we can't have the retail that we want in full degree, we'll take office space. Also, a restaurant seemed to work there. We had three or four or five before uh, the current Sticky Fingers came along, which has been a big success. Some were successful, some were not. So we, like Tubba Wubba, would get knocked down, but then get up again, because it was a constant effort of seeing your plans go forward. Now this place ha is the famous or infamous for the city of Greenville, Relax Inn. The Relax Inn was a no-tail motel. Uh, if you liked, if you were a truck driver looking for a, a one-night stand, this is the place to go. As a matter of fact, even when the city finally acquired this and tore it down, the truck drivers came, were circling the block for the next year and a half or so. Uh, and there was some business activity there. 
But a private businessman named uh, Jeff Randolph had a different vision. He envisioned converting that plot and some surrounding plots associated with the old Greenville General Hospital site. The hospital was also being torn down. To convert that into a primarily residential area consisting of condo units, apartments, uh, and also uh, single family uh, housing and um, some um, uh, retail space, retail and office space as well. These, I want to emphasize, were not happening in an orderly progression. It was happening as people came up with ideas and tried things. Some of them were. Some of them had small entrepreneurs nearby playing a role. I'm thinking of people like uh, Bob Whitley and uh, his wife, Suzanne Abrams. They were not artists, they were artistes. Um, Bob is a, a, a great craftsman. Suzanne taught my uh, daughter art in a local high school. And uh, they lived on the premises. They lived and worked at the same place. They were very active, very articulate. Another man who was active at the time was a man who owned what was once a uh, lumber yard right here, uh, um, uh, David Weeks. And David uh, was part of that group of residents, etc. Eventually, the city began looking for a place to put a baseball stadium. Now, it was, the, the story was this, we were losing. We were about to lose the Braves minor league franchise. The Braves had a baseball stadium out on the edge of town on Malden Road. They began complaining to the city and to the community, we need a new stadium. This one is uh, coming on 20 years old. And the stadium that was built in 1981 was a good little stadium for its time. But in the 80s and the 90s, the standards of expectations of what a local baseball stadium passed us by. And we needed to catch up. The Braves did not care where the stadium was. They wanted one and they wanted the community to pay for it, and they would lease it and operate it. Our problem was a lack of money and a lack of land. But we had an idea um, that maybe what would work would be a downtown baseball stadium. And maybe the right place to put it would be the West End, which was needing a big shot in the arm. Um, the Braves, unfortunately, could not wait for us to put it together. And we had what I call an amicable divorce. Uh, the Braves went to Pearl, Mississippi, which was willing to build them a stadium and was willing to do it on their time frame. We needed another couple of years to work things out. Again, we were knocked down, but we got up. We put out a uh, RFP for investor groups interested in having a baseball team to make us a proposal. We would provide them with the land. And the land we were focusing on was this, uh, the few acres of this old lumber yard. Now, it was not an easy acquisition. The Greenville County School Board also wanted the land for a high school baseball field for Greenville High, about a half a block away, and a major expansion of that campus. So here was the city turning to a fellow political subdivision saying, oh no, you can't put a baseball field there. You've got to have a baseball stadium. Um, we went to the school board with a proposal. On the first presentation, I stayed till midnight. We lost on a tie vote. The next day, someone I did not know, but who proved to be a friend of the community, Roger Meeks on the baseball 
uh, on the uh, school board. An independent insurance agent called up and said, I think it can be done, but we don't want to work with the developer that you are looking at. We want to work with the city directly, and I want to work with you one-on-one. -on -one. Two months later, another late night meeting. I'm presenting at the baseball, at the baseball, at the school board meeting. And I have to tell you that the angriest, most vicious opponent we've ever encountered were the parents supporting the high school baseball field. They were taking no prisoners. Um, one person changed his vote. And after staying to 2 a.m. on my wife's birthday, <laughs> uh, we came away with a deal. We would uh, acquire the site from them, and we would assemble a separate site for them contiguous to the high school. It was a monumental task because the Greenville City Council, being the council that it is, said, no eminent domain. That's, that's tying your hands. But that was the deal. That's what we did. And we got a baseball stadium, the outside of which looks like, I'll give you a few. This is the ticket office. Uh, this is the interior space. Um, notice the big green wall replica for a um, Boston Red Sox affiliate. This is an old fire station. The West End Fire Station, built in the teens or 20s. We sold it to a private entrepreneur in the early days. He put up a coffee roasting business there. When we needed to acquire it for the baseball stadium purposes, he sold it back to us for about two or three times what he had bought it from us for. But he used that same money to go across the street and invest in a new building in the West End for his business activity. Uh, one person instrumental in recruiting the successful RFP bidders was David Glenn. David's a local developer. He developed a portion of this exterior wall here, these exterior buildings, consisting of condos, apartments, business offices, and street-level retail. He went to uh, the group that owned the uh, Chattanooga baseball uh, franchise and um, persuaded them to come to Greenville and to check it out and to submit a proposal. They did, and they were the successful proposers. This is the old uh, um, um, roadway across the downtown Rita River Falls, a highway that blocked the view. You could never see the falls from the highway. The city, for its part, persuaded the DOT to give us the road, transfer it to us. We tore it down in an environmentally responsible way George, and uh, uh, replaced it with a pedestrian bridge and a park. And let me tell you, I know we're talking about businesses, but I want to talk about the garden club ladies when we talk about buy-in. The downtown garden club said we want to raise money for an endowment to help perpetuate the care of the park. Yes. Um, they set as their goal about one and a half million dollars. They raised four million dollars. Simply because there was buy-in, there was interest. Uh, about the same time, uh, the South Carolina School, a governor's school for the arts and humanities was locating there. These things happen because the other thing is happening. There's a kinetic energy. There's a, there's a buy-in by people believing that this, in contrast to what I originally showed you, is the way the West End could look and be and feel. So uh, sorry for taking too much time if I did, but it's a perfect Cinderella story 
grassroots initiative at the local level, cooperation by the local government, and investors from New York for the baseball team, David Glenn, a local developer, and all those mom and pops who made it successful. Next speaker is Ed Mehmet, city manager of Spartanburg. And I just need to uh, bring up his presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you George. Uh, I am city manager for uh, the city of Spartanburg, but I, I'm probably, I am not the person most qualified to speak about the Northside Initiative. And we purposely named it Northside Initiative because it's very much a work in progress. This is, I think, a little different from you heard. It certainly has elements of what you heard from Greenville, Greer, and Lake City. But it is a, a very low income, very distressed area of our city that we have been working on, and I want to share the story. Again, this, this story goes, could go back 30 years. I won't take you back 30 years, but the city is a player in this, is a partner. We are not the driving force, and I want to make that clear. We have set up, we have, the community has created a separate entity that is solely focused on the north side. And uh, we think that's a, a winning strategy, and we'll try to explain why. So I hope to work through these. Uh, this shows you, uh, gives you some orientation to where the north side is. If you're generally familiar with downtown Spartanburg, you would be uh, in an aircraft looking north over the part of our downtown. You see the, the large uh, structure in the foreground is the uh, VCOM. It is, the, uh, it is a new osteopathic medical college that built a new $25 million facility on the north side. They selected that location. They could have selected a greenfield. In fact, we thought they were going to locate just outside of the city. We thought they were going to locate in Charlotte. They came to Spartanburg as their second campus. It has 320 graduate students, which rotate third year. They rotate out to their residency. It is a private not-for-profit. They're open. They have, their first campus is in Blacksburg. Uh, their, second, their second campus is here in Spartanburg. Their third campus is under construction at Auburn University. So we were very fortunate to get VCOM to come. VCOM was very much a catalyst for an area that we wanted to do something we didn't know where to start. We didn't know what would kickstart and give us confidence that we could pull off something fundamentally and transformative uh, in the north side. Walford College is two blocks to the, uh, two blocks to the east. Spartanburg Regional Medical are one of our largest employers. 3,500 employees on campus, five blocks away, had virtually no interaction with the north side before this effort. Very close to downtown, three blocks from the 240 room downtown Marriott Hotel, close to Walford. The investment at VCOM gave us reasons to be optimistic and hopeful that we could take this area that has struggled uh, for over 50 years and do something uh, different. So those are the, uh, the challenges. I have a, uh, I'm gonna have to slide around. Uh, uh, so the challenges, there've been decades of deterioration, disinvestment, uh, there has been Spartanburg at one time, or a community of about 40,000, 45,000, now down to about 3,800. If you are familiar with public housing, Spartanburg had 1,500 units of fixed-based public housing within the city limits. Of that is a lot of public housing. Spartanburg went big in public housing and went big in urban renewal back in, all through the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. A lot of public housing, a lot of concentration of public housing on the north side. Not only public housing, but a form of public housing. It's publicly subsidized, but privately owned, called Mod Rehab. And it was one of those three, of the three units we have in Spartanburg, one was located here, and is still in private hands today, and it's very much a challenge. So very much a concentration of very low income people. It was also the site of a mill, uh, Spartan Mill, which is now the, where VCOM's located. The mill closed. It, it was the slow death of mills that happened all across the state and across the southeast. So, uh, so this was uh, what uh, we refer to as a case study of a long-term pattern of disinvestment. Uh, the opportunities, uh, property was cheap. Uh, that was an op we saw that as an opportunity. It's proximity to which I've mentioned to several, several anchors. We thought we can, we can do better. Uh, we also, uh, 
and we had the large 18 acre vacant mill site. The only thing left on the mill site after demolition was the smokestack. Uh, the, the, the person, the owner was a local uh, businessman named Jimmy Gibbs and he had a, he had one soft spot, at least one soft spot in his heart related to the smoke tower. Maybe he didn't want to spend the money to tear it down, I don't know. Uh, but uh, so we purchased from 2000s, I see Martin Livingston in the room. Martin worked at the city about 14 years ago, give or take. And we were picking off properties as we could, prop purchases of opportunities. We'd buy them close, hoping for the day that we would have an opportunity on the north side, but weren't ready to take that chance. And in fact, we were concentrating our efforts on doing a lot of things on the south side of the city at the time. Um, VCOM's investment changed all of it. They didn't ask us to do anything. They didn't ask us for the land. They didn't ask us for anything. Uh, well, they asked us, what do you intend to do around the site? Which, and we said, you come, we'll make it different. We'll put every effort we can do to organize this community and bring uh, uh, in positive development. So when VCOM came, we then said, what, what now? What next? What, what can we do? Uh, and I think this is instructive of, of Spartanburg and instructive that uh, uh, it is not about who does what and who get. it's not about who gets credit, it's about how things get done. I think that's a, uh, you'll find that in successful projects that uh, if, you're, if no one's focused and worried about who gets credit, things tend to get done a lot more. Mayor White, our Mayor White, asked former Mayor Bill Barnett, Bill was, had been mayor for eight years, very successful, very successful businessman, uh, uh, known nationally for his uh, philanthropy and his business savvy, Mayor White asked Bill Barnett, would you, would you head this effort up? Would you take this effort on? I'll do whatever you need me to do, but will you be lead? That doesn't happen in the world of, no offense, Mayor, it uh, doesn't happen as often as maybe it should, but it happened in Spartanburg, and I think it speaks highly of both folks to do that. Bill, if you know Bill Barnett, he said, look, I'm not, I'm not interested in onesies and twosies and building a couple of new houses. We got to do something transformative. I'm not interested. I'm not, I got other things to do, I can do, but if you're, and he's told that to the city, he said, I'm going to tell this to other folks, if you're interested in doing something trans transformative, I'm all in. He said, great. So then we say, okay, now how do we go about, uh, how do we go about doing it? What, what next? So we, before we started, and I think this is, you'll find this different and important and, and, and enlightening. Uh, we went and asked folks, institutions, foundations, and business people, when we, primarily Bill, said, will you invest in this? Will you put money in this effort? They said, what are you gonna do? We're gonna change it. We don't know exactly what and where and how, but we're gonna change it. The status quo was not acceptable. And they bought in. So we, Bill was able to, largely Bill, uh, was able to raise significant amount of money uh, and let us start without a plan. It was, our impulse was not to do a plan first. In fact, we said, we don't, it's premature to do a plan. We need money and we need a palette. I like to think of it, if we're gonna paint something new, we need a palette, we need land. We need to be in control of land and we need to be in control of the strategic locations where, of that land. So, raise money, use it to acquire land, and then we said, all right, what models are there out there in the country that are similar to us that we want to be, that we would like to learn from and try to gain uh, the benefit of? We found purpose-built communities. Uh, we knew of them, uh, purpose-built, and uh, I'll share a little bit of detail. What is purpose-built? Purpose-built is a national nonprofit. It's an outgrowth of the uh, East Lake uh, project in Atlanta. They do not, they take the principles of, they, of that uh, form the basis of East Lake, and Purpose Built is the entity that they want to take that model and take it out to other parts of the country. You have to get into the affiliate, you have to apply to be a Purpose Built affiliate. You have to go through the process. They have to like you, and you have to like them, and you end up, so we said Purpose Built makes sense to us. They don't give you money, they do give you consulting advice. All of the other communities that are affiliate so purpose-built have a charter school and model involved. 
that was part of the basis of the redevelopment in, in Atlanta. We don't have a charter school. We're different. We don't think it's, that they can replicate the model, charter school model across the country. And only Bill Barnett could say, you need us worse than we need you to purpose build. And they believe it. And they said, so we, we are the affiliate, the eighth affiliate in the purpose built network. And we think it's been a good partnership. We think it'll be strategic and help us along the way. Uh, North, we created the uh, Northside Development Corporation. I mentioned that Northside Development is a nonprofit. Uh, Bill serves as chair. Others are appointed to it uh, based on their participation their, or their organization's participation in the uh, effort. And the Northside is fo solely focused on the Northside. Doesn't worry about the South Side, doesn't worry about other things that the city's worried about, doesn't worry about downtown, worries about the North Side all day, every day. So, what have we done? I mentioned that we, uh, so this is, uh, I want to sh share, and this, I apologize, this is the master plan. We just had the master plans uh, about six months old. And you can see, you can perhaps see down at VCOM, it's located, I don't have a pointer of VCOM, but we have, a, now we have a great grand vision. We have a plan, and we'll follow the plan like many others have, that we'll follow the plan to the extent that it benefits us. But we've also had to, to in this balancing of planning and doing, and what we've been trying to do. All right, wanna talk about uh, Cleveland Elementary. We knew that Cle Cleveland Elementary and our work with District 7, seven school districts in Spartanburg County, District 7 serves this, the city, uh, and uh, primarily all the city. We knew we could not have a trans, we cannot transform the north side without transforming Cleveland Elementary. 99% poverty rate, free lunch exclusively, declining student population. Seven, District 7 knew it and understood it and wanted to be part because for years we had pointed at each other and said, you're creating problems. Your bad schools are creating problems for us. We'd, they'd say your bad neighborhoods are creating problems for us. So nothing was ever getting done. So we sat down and said, what can we do? How can we change? So Cleveland, Cleveland Elementary became Cleveland Academy of Leadership. It is the only school in the state, public school in the state, with a 205-day academic year. This is the, they will start their third full year of 205 days. Their classes start July 9th. They go six weeks of additional instruction for those students. Test, uh, progress has gone significantly, has gone up significantly. It's still very much a work in progress, but we would never attract a different population without the elementary school being part of it. So that's different for us. We have always worked well with seven, but today we are working hand in hand with District 7. Healthy Food Hub is be our farmer's market in the north side. We're moving it. It will also be an area that is, has tr uh, training for uh, culinary arts, where people that are in need of a second chance have the opportunity to come and receive 13 weeks of culinary training and that project is under construction. So again, doing, planning and doing. Here's an example of a plan. You can see photographs of the uh, project under construction. These are model homes being built by the Spartanburg Housing Authority. That is an example, an example of how public housing will be delivered in Spartanburg going forward. Much different model. So, fo so far, what have we accomplished? $4 million in private fundraising, 170 properties acquired, Construction of the Food Hub, Brawley Street Model uh, part, Purpose Built Affiliation, Choice Neighborhood Planning Grant, Cleveland Academy, you can see the accomplishments. So far, we're making progress. Got a long way to go, a lot of work to do. And our threats to success, I think you, it's always smart to understand where you are, what the threats are. Control of key development sites is a big challenge for us. We will not use eminent domain for this project to acquire the sites. Uh, funding is always a challenge. Where do we, we are not gonna be dependent on the state and the federal government. Frankly, I think they're, personally, I think they're so dysfunctional. Why would we count on? Why would we count on those? Communication, folks, uh, there, there's always this dynamic of, of making sure that the uh, information is shared, we're transparent, and folks understand what we're trying to uh, accomplish. Maintaining partnerships, you can't assume that relationships are going to last, and maintaining trust would be something I would encourage you to always reinforce and not take any of those for granted. So those are some of, we're very much, again, very much a work in progress, and we're not where some of these other projects are. We have just now getting started and trying to move an effort forward.
that concludes my remarks. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Who, uh, who has a question for the group? Rob Hanley. Most of this question is directed at Ed, and that is, uh, in, in the partnership and the plan, you have a food hub. Are there any plans in that food hub to help the folks you hope to attract to that neighborhood become more food independent and I ask that question because there's a lot of research that shows low and disadvantaged neighborhoods often have very poor access to good, healthy food. But if you teach folks and give them opportunities to grow their own, they may be able to take advantage of what they have instead of relying on what others offer them. Uh, the short answer is yes. Community gardens will also, we will not have access to, they will not have access to full groceries, but uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. We'll also, uh, the facility there will accept SNAP payments. So we are trying to uh, provide access to healthy food uh, through this location. It will not be a full service grocery store. We're not ready. It's not ready to support a full service grocery store. It's interesting that there is no, has been no, uh, full research study to determine if healthy foods are available to low-income neighborhoods, that it'll actually change outcomes. There's, there's the supposition that it will. It's never been tested. There is a grant to test the premise through the National Institute of Health, through the Arnold School of Business, to study what will happen if you offer healthy foods to a low-income neighborhood. And then the study will be based in the north side. So it's, it's an effort to test the premise to see if it works. We'll find out. Who else? Ed, I know that uh, the uh, rental assistance demonstration program that is a federal program, maybe unfortunately, um, you, that Spartanburg is ahead of the rest of the state in using that vehicle this is a program where a housing authority can take over its public housing units as its private assets and then use that to basically leverage uh, bond financing and other financing to totally take over and transform public housing. Every single one of the communities represented uh, potentially has an opportunity to use this program, but would you comment on how you have, how that is operating? And I don't know if any of the other communities, I don't know if Lake City has looked at that model or not, but it, I think it's something that could be beneficial. I'll come, uh, uh, Tom, uh, Tom's right. Uh, RAD offers local housing authorities the opportunity to private, essentially privatize access capital, take it of uh, public housing out of federal ownership. Uh, our council has been open to the notion of in, in, in their moving forward. Our housing authority is moving forward with one project, Cammy Claggett, and we'll see. Uh, again, when you have a, such a concentration of public housing, the opportunity to bring capital, the federal government is not in a position to fund the capital needs of public housing across this country. So now they're saying how can we do that? And they can do that by making, essentially, uh, letting local housing authorities convert it to private ownership and then utilize re sor sources of funding, low-income ta housing tax credits, bond financing, to bring capital to the renovation and also bring private management to it. So for us, it's something we're, we're very interested. We're also interested in how it works post-20-year period of rental assistance, too, which is a concern and we want to make sure we understand. Some housing authorities across the country have not, been, have not received it well, and I think some of the political leadership has questioned what happens after 20 years. Again, in Spartanburg, we have three that you would, you would think are public housing complexes, but they're privately owned, project-based Section 8 assistance, and two of them are big problems for us. One of them's located on the north side. It's actually owned by the owner of the Miami Dolphins. Believe that, 105 units is owned by Stephen Ross, who owns thousands of affordable housing units across this country. He did not know he owned Oakview. He does now, and so we're trying to we're, we're trying to get it extracted from him. 
Thank you. Who else? Dr. Prince. Let me uh, commend Ed for bringing in Cleveland Elementary School into the mix. Uh, Rick, are there plans with your footprint for Greer to work with schools, to bring them in? And then, Ron, what happened with Greenville High's baseball field? There is no community development without school development simultaneously, somewhere in the midst. It, it's an interesting question because the city of Greer is actually in two counties, so we work with two different school districts. Um, I don't know if it's the same experience across the state, um, but, but, but typically the school dif districts and often other governmental entities have not always been the best of communicators. Uh, and in a lot of cases it is demand and response kind of things um, in, in terms of identifying the sites for the schools. Uh, we did have a good experience with um, District 5 of the uh, Spartanburg County side in terms of locating a elementary school in an area where we were projecting growth on the other side of 85. Um, it, has, it has been a good experience for us because it, has, um, it has, uh, has shown us that the ideals of smart growth do indeed work and it has given us the ability to address some of those infrastructure needs that you'll find around a developing area that is typically started by a school. Uh, we can address some of the road issues. Um, we can address um, some subdivision issues. Um, all of that just by simply being in front of it and that allows us to go ahead and address kind of the things that we'll have to address, the county to address their issues, and the school district. So indeed you're right, it, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of communication, but uh, one of the quality of life issues that drives development is certainly schools. I'm going to quickly answer the second one for Ron because it's an, it's an enormous credit to him. I took the side of the West End Baseball Stadium to the city, and I spent six months of my life trying to get the city of Greenville and the, and the high school to share it. They, as Ron said, were angry and would not do it. Ron's solution was to take almost two square city blocks and make it, it was land that the Greenville High School probably should have had 20 years ago or 40 years ago. Ron, it was in private hands. Ron got all 22 individual lots. I think there were 22. It's a beautiful facility now. The team plays on the side as does the soccer team and a lot of other teams. It's, it's, it's just a magnificent development. Uh, and it's to Ron's credit that he could make all that happen. I love to take credit. <laughs> I'm certainly not above it. <laughs> Um, but uh, I think uh, the, the concept I, I, I certainly participated in and um, advocating it in front of the school board I participated in uh, but the current city manager John Castile who was then uh, assistant city manager did the hard leg work and if there's one thing you carry away from you today I want to emphasize the importance of hard leg work you were absolutely on point about the interaction of schools and communities and municipal governments. I can't tell you how many years we advocated for a new elementary school in the southern side area and the west end area and it led, I am convinced, uh, to you know, you know, there's the parable in the New Testament of the unjust judge who gives the woman what she's asking for just to get rid of her. Finally, the school board saw fit to build the A.J. Wittenberg uh, Engineering Academy. Uh, it's a big success. It cooperates with uh, the Croc Center for um, a cross-cultural recreation center. And the city also, uh, I would add, uh, has some other elementary schools in the city where it takes care of playground equipment and makes it available to the schools. So they go hand in hand like that because if you want to recruit new residents 
and families, you've got to have good schools. And I, I want to share. Uh, I'm, I'm sh share one comment in it, how, how we used it uh, in Spartanburg, and I haven't told my friends in Greenville this. Uh, uh, in 1989, I was working in community, went to work in the city of Greenville in community development, working up on the eighth floor. And a colleague uh, in, the, in economic development came down, had been in the job of maybe six months, he said, I want to show you something. I said, what do you want to show me? He said, I want to show you a plan for the west side. And it had condominiums on the Reedy River, on the Reedy River. It had a hotel on the Reedy River. And this was somebody that grew up in Greenville and had known the Reedy River as the raunchy Reedy River. That's what it was referred to in cheers from teams, other teams I uh, attended Greenville High School, and other teams had cheers about the raunchy Reedy, on the banks of the raunchy Reedy River. And he also said, we're going to blow up the Camperdown Bridge. And that's the bridge Ron showed. And I said, you're nuts. That will never happen. Why, who goes, why would you go on, why would this happen? None of it will happen. Over the course of 15, 20 years, 20, it happened. It is happening. So when I... When we crack open plans and talk about the north side, I have used the example internally to our staff and said, it can happen. It will happen. You got to believe it'll happen incrementally. It won't happen overnight. So another message you can take is that it, it is not impossible. It is steps, small steps lead to bigger steps. <coughs> Those steps lead to something else. You build on your momentum. And from somebody that's been to Spartanburg, and folks ask me where I'm from now, I say Spartanburg. Uh, and, uh, but we have recognized, and that, that example has stuck with me. Because when I, in 1989, when you left City Hall in downtown Greenville, as great as it is, you turned left. You did not turn right. You did not walk right towards the west end. You would turn left to go, or you go straight across the street to the Hot Dog King. You didn't have a lot of choices back then. So it can happen. Where, whatever your challenges are, wherever they are, it can happen. So. Thank you, Ed. The clock just rang 4.30. Gentlemen, any final thoughts or comments you'd like to make? On behalf of all of us, thank you for coming. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs>